let's do just very short reflection about the discussion group. <coughs> How you experienced it. I just again, just to connect with the mind. This is what you will hear again and again in your spiritual practice. Go back to the mind. Don't, don't be stuck in the emotions or whatever. Go back to the mind. Go back to that one which experienced <coughs> the emotion. Yeah? So of course with sensations and emotions and perceptions and all this we train to be present. But then the next step is really to go back to the mind. How is the mind? So you ask yourself. So again, you know, don't look at me. I'm not the mind. And so kind of spiritual practice is a, a meeting with yourself to really get to know yourself. So then we have to let go of all fears that we might find horrible things. Whatever we can find is horrible, we can say it's not in the nature of the mind. And everything can be transformed when I recognize it. So try to close your eyes. if at all possible. Bring the mind into the hall, to the body. And then to connect mentally with the people that you were in the discussion group with. actually very often in the discussion group we discover that what we're saying is not totally true when we hear ourselves saying it. So we kind of mentally thank the others for having listened to us. Also very often when somebody listens to us we start to understand, we start to understand ourselves in a better way. Again, just open up your heart by connecting with these people and in a very simple way say thank you for having shared with you their experience and especially for having listened to us. Close your eyes, go inside, nothing to be afraid of. Connect with that space, the goodness that we have when we say thank you. When we put ourselves second or third, or at the end of the line, and we put others before us. Maybe somebody got on your nerves in the discussion group, that's also possible, so then try to see them again, try to see the similarity. They're not in the way they are to make you upset or to get on your nerves. <coughs> that is the way they are. Some other people might love them very much, even though our ego says, nah, not possible. So they're not exactly the way you see them. You only see part of it. And very often because they kind of touch on our own weak points, they act as a mirror, then we start to get nervous. So right now, so that it doesn't become very deep, let go of that nervousness or aversion. And as we did the before, wish the person well. May you be happy, may you be well. May you not meet with rejection again and again and again as I was just showing you. Not openly. And then try to see the difference if you are able to open your heart. A closed heart that rejects. An open heart that connects and sees the similarity. So the way to let go of these negative feelings, just be aware of them and don't feed into them with a story. 
just experience them. And then look what happens if you don't feed it with a story. So here nothing is suppressed. We acknowledge everything. We accept these negative feelings, but then we try to look into their nature as being impermanent <coughs> and needing causes which are our thoughts, our opinions about this person. If you take that away, the negative emotion disappears very quickly. It just collapses. Because when you look at the sensation of the emotion, you are not in the emotion. You are in the mind of awareness, of looking, the observer. And like this we don't identify with them so much. able to let go of that closed heart, tense mind, fantastic. If not, it's no big deal. We can train this again and again and again until we know the technique. There is a question here, which is a very good question, of course. Like, how with an open heart, doing good to <coughs> others and myself simultaneously in my life, when I care for others, I forget me, how to do both. Well, <laughs> you see, this is the thing, we, th this is attached love, wanting to do something for others so in order, so something should come back. So, as I said at the beginning, the first steps are to really create a, a life situation where, um, where your life goes fairly easy by being careful about our actions now. Now again, if you don't believe in rebirth, this is very difficult to understand how <coughs> our actions from past lives kind of influence our life now. So there's not so much what we can do. The karma that we already created in the past, this is we have no control. This then ripens as in two ways. It ripens um, like kind of the same experience happening to us, like when we steal, cheat, reject, <coughs> angry, no respect and all this. This is like a boomerang. At one, at one point it will come back. Yeah? If we do it the other way, then that will also come back. So. When we talk about karma, which means action, sometimes people use the word karma only as if it's only negative. Karma means actions, and these actions are skillful or unskillful. They are creating happiness or creating suffering. So the same thing happening to us actually is not so bad. It would actually, if we know that we have created a consequence, it would teach us a lesson. And we think, oh, if I don't want this to come back in that way, I better stop doing these actions now. 
But the problem is we don't remember, and again, in, in, in the West, we don't even believe in rebirth, so it's very, very difficult um, to accept when something negative happens to us and not to react with anger and aversion. Yeah, to say, again, if you know the law of cause and effect, which is karma, you can react in two ways. You can say, oh, it's my fault, and kind of I deserve it, which doesn't help. Or, hey, this is my responsibility. I threw the boomerang. Yeah? Or sometimes one starts to use this example, like ordering something on the internet. Yeah? It's very easy to order it. One click, and that's it. It's ordered. Yeah? Do you know? Uh, Cancelling it is very difficult. <laughs> yeah, if you want to cancel something that you ordered on the internet, and now with the with the, with our karmic actions, you know that before be, until this parcel comes, it takes so long that you totally forgot that you you don't remember that you ordered it. Yeah, so if you didn't cancel it with karma, at one point it will come. Yeah, same as the internet. So then if it's something that you still want and makes you happy, then you, you don't really care whether you ordered it or not. You keep it with a very happy mind. If it's something that you have changed your habits or now you dislike or you already bought something else or you, you don't need it anymore, you get angry. And when you forgot that you ordered it, you blame the company for sending you something that you didn't order. Yeah, you take the telephone and you start to complain and this and that until they send you the confirmation of your of your ordering click. Then maybe you start to calm down and then you say, oh shit, still shit, I still don't want this thing, but what do I do with it now? So this is an understanding of karmic actions and karmic results. When the results come, whether they, you like them or not, you really check, what do I do with them now? And every negative, um, every it would be it positive or negative, it can serve as for us to grow. And especially the negative situations. Because in the positive situations, which we all love, we don't really learn so much. But in the negative ones, we, can, we, we really have to force ourselves to practice patience and to open up. And the turmoil in an emotion, you can see much better uh, when, the, when the emotion is negative. And then also to kind of to liberate the emotion into its own nature when you just stay with it is much easier done when with anger or depression or uh, you know a lot of desire and all this okay so actually with time you start to see these negative emotions as your teacher you welcome them like a gift from your teacher who shows you where your mind actually is because sometimes, you know, when things go really well, we think we're quite good and we're quite <laughs> compassionate. I even, hear, I even hear people say sometimes, you know, uh, the other day I talked to somebody and we talked about intelligence. And again, I said, I don't know why intelligence is seen as so, something so wonderful. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that the person is a good person. And, um, and then the person said, well, but I have a good heart. I want to work with my intelligence. Then I thought, that, wow, you know, that kind of self-confidence. And uh, that, but that can also be totally, it's, it's good to ask other people sometimes, what do you think? Do I really not need to work on my good heart anymore? Do you think I really have it? Just to, you know, just to do like kind actions here and there, that doesn't mean that you have a good heart. Yeah, you do it out of habit or because you like to do it or whatever, or because you have a good heart. But the good heart is, and this is, should answer this question, it's not the action, it is your attitude. So the same way as we are not going around destroying things when there is no aggression and no anger, the same way we're not really going around doing kind of mitzvahs or good actions when love is not there because it's, it, it's not... It's not what it should be. So the same way as anger and aggression, kind of, you don't need to force yourself to do the action. It just comes spontaneously. Either you withdraw or you live it out. So the same way, first you just work with your mind to develop an open heart. You don't even act yet. Yeah? 
And then you start to see, actually, when you act with an open heart, whatever you do for others is really good for you. Yeah? And whatever you do for yourself, meaning working on that open heart, working with uh, kind of taking care of your negative emotions, is good for others. So it goes together. Yeah. And when your heart is totally open, you see, when, when we do this, when we, do, when we try to be kind to others, like good acts and all this, and we're afraid that nothing comes back or, oh, I will disappear, there's a lot of self-interest behind it. And then you have a good chance that if nothing comes back, you get, um, you know, you get hurt or you get, you burn out or, or whatever, which you do. This is the thing, you, you can do too much and you can give too much. This is why, as I'm saying, we start first with ourselves to have contemplations, for example, to really appreciate our, our situation in life. Not to always look at the negative sides and what we don't have. But the first step is really to start to, um, yeah, to appreciate and to see how, how privileged we actually are. I mean, if I look at your faces, I don't think you realize how privileged you are. Do you? You know, we should go around, jumping around the whole day and being like, wow, I'm so lucky, I'm so fortunate. And you can't, this again, you know, it doesn't come spontaneously because our ego-clinging mind, which is discontent, always wants something different. Because it's looking in the wrong place. It is looking in people being nice to me. The whole world can be nice to you. If you are not able to have an open heart, you will not believe them and you'll be miserable and you go and jump off a cliff. <coughs> this happens to very famous people sometimes. You know, we put a lot of hope into, oh, when everybody admires me and when I become famous and then I have a lot of money and I have a very comfortable life, that then it will make us happy. And some of these people who put a lot of effort into becoming famous, um, they need a lot of drugs <coughs> to be able to continue in that way because they need to perform. Yeah? And they need to show joy and happiness. They cannot go on stage and be depressed. So quite a few of them are, are addicted to something. <coughs> many, many years ago, the first time I was in Israel, somebody invited me to go to a lot. So I gave some, there's some kind of, you know, my age hippies, still hippies living down there. So I was invited to give a talk to them. So while I was giving them a talk, they were smoking joints. Um, <laughs> that's what hippies do. And I talk, actually I talked about the nature of existence, that it's unreliable and it's dissatisfying and all this. And then they tried to, they constantly, they looked at me as if I'm from another planet. And they said, but look, we're happy, we're content, we're da da da. So I said, why do you need to smoke dope then? <laughs> yeah? Yes, we can sustain a certain amount of happiness and contentment if we dull ourselves with these kind of chemicals to the pain. And then we become dependent on these chemicals because the mind has not been made resilient and strong to be able to bear it, to be able to see that, wow, life is really not a pleasure grove. We would like it to be a pleasure grove, but it is not. But it becomes more bearable when we open up our heart to facts, instead of living in fantasies that, for me, life should be wonderful. This is what we all think, deep down. Automatic pilot is, yeah, yeah, I see. Other people have problems, that's okay. Other people, they don't get what they want, that's okay, but I should get what I want, isn't it? Deep down, we have this automatic pilot, and it's by sitting and watching your mind that it comes up. So if, if the, the, the ones who are at the beginning of your practice, and you think, you know, if you sit maybe 20 minutes every day, and then you have a, your mind will be open and happy and all this, well, you get a big surprise. Because first, you start to see the dirt. First, we start to really see how selfish we are, how childish we are, and how we cling 
to these things that really make that ego, that I in here, really solid and really true and really whatever, real. Yeah? And that can be quite frightening. So we Westerners, we have a big disadvantage. Because if you're born a Buddhist, the first thing you hear is about your Buddha nature. To say, this is just dirt. This is just, it's not oneness with the mind. This can be washed out. This can be eliminated. So you don't even start to identify with it. Whereas we, we, we don't hear this. So we think that at the basis, we are bad people. And then we, of course, then we don't want to look at these things. Yeah. It's like having a t-shirt that you never saw that the t-shirt is clean. You, you never even try to make it clean because you have never seen it clean. So for you, the dirt is just, well, it's oneness with the t-shirt, so you're not trying to clean it. Whereas if you understand that it can be clean, then you go through the effort of making it clean. Okay? So the thing here is like at the beginning you just work with having an open heart, some patience with people that get on your nerves. Um, not even doing things for them, but taking your own needs a little bit back. You know. Love, love is kind of you, well, sometimes they use images which are quite nice. Um, you know, uh, some insects have like antennas where they feel where they should go, or the cats with their hair here. Yeah? So love is like out of an open heart. You, you, you let these antennas go out to the other person, and you start to see or to feel what the other person needs. And very often, it's the same as with ourselves. They don't need material things. They just need to be listened to without us jumping in with giving them good advice what they should do and how they should change and how they could be in a better way use this good advice for yourself we're always very ready to tell somebody else how they could change for the better isn't it no when somebody comes and complains oh you know then we have very good advice we say oh don't worry it's true because worry doesn't make it better. That's a very good advice. But do we ever apply it to ourselves? When we feel that we start to fantasize about the future and we start to worry, do we ever apply it to ourselves? Do you ever tell yourself, hey, come on, stop worrying, it's okay. Do you ever say that to yourself? As many times as you say it to others? Yes, more. Huh? Okay, good. Great. And what does it do then? Yeah, exactly. We let go. Yeah? yeah? So if we tell it to others. With others, it doesn't really work. Because when others tell us not to worry, we see this as kind of, hey, they don't understand what is happening with me. They have no compassion. They don't really listen to what I'm going through or whatever. Yeah? So all now is saying it to ourselves. So that's that's what I mean. This is what these this advice is for. So then the second thing we say, don't worry. What do what else do we say? It will be okay. <laughs> it will be okay. It will pass. And it's so true. It will pass. You know, problems you had like twenty years ago. Where are they now? Finished. It's not that we don't have any other problems. Our, our mind is a problem picker. It it's not the mind. It's the ego. The ego loves problems because the moment you start to open up, the moment you start to see your own goodness, you start to believe in it, that's it. Your ego has no more control over you. This is why it clings. This is a two problems. This is why it doesn't want to let go. And I see this sometimes with people who think they can only talk to me because they're having problems. So then, because they, if they come to me and ask me, then I do try to help them. Otherwise, I leave people alone, you know. Um, so whatever I say, I feel to the resistance to what I say, and then I start to understand, if they apply these things, it will work, and then how are they going to talk to me? <laughs> yeah? So it's the same. You see, this whole thing is about, as I said yesterday, to become an ordinary person. So you become kind of, in, the, in worldly terms, you become boring, because people ask you, how are you? And you say, fine. That's it. <laughs> Conversation finished. <laughs> yeah? And if on top of it you mean it, 
you can be totally open and then people start to trust you because they see, oh, she's okay. So now I can pour out my problem there. <laughs> then if you react to it, then that shows maybe you're not as well as you thought you are. Yeah? Maybe you're just saying it. So, so like this. So these kind of, yes, it's okay, don't worry, it will pass. We can apply that to ourselves. Okay? So by taking good care of ourselves means we stop creating negative action voluntarily. This is the first step. And how do we do it? that again so that it becomes easier? We start to see the situation that we have right now. We don't, we're not in a situation where you have to do a lot of negative actions in order to survive. We do negative actions because we have a habit of doing them and we're lazy to, you know, to, to um, how to say, to practice discipline, right? That's one thing. Uh, and we, we're not afraid or we're not worried about the consequences. Yeah, we just order, you know, with body, speech and mind, we just order anything that comes across us in the internet. Oh yeah, maybe this is, maybe this, maybe that, maybe that. And it's just, you know, click, 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 click. Every moment, our mind orders something. Either with an action of the body or with an action of the mind or with an action of the speech. Yeah, so then, and then it will, it will come. These results, uh, they will come. So we appreciate the situation that we are exposed to those teachings. Um, we understand that we have the freedom or, uh, you know, freedom to come here for the moment. Some of you, some of, some of you don't. I mean, all of, the, all of you who are here now have taken that freedom, but some of you I know are having like thoughts of concern about the children at home and you know, it, it, it's difficult. So for those who do not have children who need you, my gosh, you so uh, be happy about this, yeah? Because you can ask every mother who is here who has young children that it's not such an, it's not such an easy and open thought as it was before you had children, isn't it? Yeah, so sometimes young mothers with young children, when they look at people without children and, and they, they hear and they don't really practice and they're lazy and you know, Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. They go like, wow, if they would only realize how precious that situation is that they are having, they would have much more joy in practicing. But the thing is, we only realize that something is good once it's gone. We start to appreciate things when they're finished and we go, oh, why didn't I appreciate it more when it was there? Yeah, so. That's a shame. So uh, again, very consciously with thoughts uh, in contemplations, we think, wow, I am so fortunate. I have access to these teachings. The teachings are being practiced. I have role models like Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama, who have difficult situations, who are full of humor and, and lightness and, 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 and spaciousness and, and fun and joy and happiness. I can, I can, if they can do it with their problems, I should be able to do it. And then we start to look, why are they able to do that? You know, our lazy ego mind against us, yeah, well, that's for them, they were born like this. I am not like this, I cannot do that. Then you start to ask them or you start to listen to what they say and you start to, to see the methods that they are using to have that mind. And these methods are different. Desmond Tutu has a God and a Jesus. Whereas Buddhism has karma, yeah. So, so it's totally different, but the results are wonderful if it is practiced in an honest way. Then in order to use that situation, we kind of contemplate that it will not last. At one point, either situations change in us, like we, when you're young, you start to have children, or when you get older, maybe you get sick, you cannot come anymore. Uh, or, I don't know, Yechiam closes, or the Dharma friends fall apart, and uh, uh, who knows, or Buddhism is not allowed, you're not allowed to practice it anymore. I mean, there are countries where you're not allowed to practice these things. Who knows? So, again, we, we put permanence into the situations, and then we don't take advantage of them. So we think about, like, for example, you can start with, May this year become especially beneficial. Then you think, may this month become beneficial. 
May this day become beneficial. May this hour become beneficial. May this minute become beneficial. And if you used to do that, the mind again from being kind of lost in thoughts about the past and the future, it comes back to the present and you relax. You see, just a wish, a genuine, honest wish to be of benefit to others opens your heart, brings you to the present. But because we kind of then, the ego comes in again and uses it as a self-glorification because, wow, if I'm a benefit to others, I'll be so noble and I'll be so wonderful and people will love me. Then again, you go like, but how? It's far too early to ask how. Just nourish that wish to be of benefit to others again and again and again and again and again. The same way we nourish our aggression from irritation frustration, uh, rejection, it becomes stronger, it goes into aggression, anger, hate. And then we cannot act differently. Yeah? But the action doesn't come yet with the, just with the frustration. It comes when we let the mind go that way. Yeah? So once the mind is filled with love and compassion, the actions will follow. There is no need to worry about that. So instead of worrying now how you should help others, uh, worry about how to, how to not harm them, for example. That's much more beneficial. Does that make sense? Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I took this acorn, uh, so maybe to show you something. There's plenty of those lying around. Yeah? Each of them, acorns. Each of them has inside the potential to be a tree. Each of them. But in order, so it has the potential, they're all the same in that potential. But in order for them to become a tree, they need conditions. Otherwise, they get trampled on, or they rot, or whatever, and then they will never become a tree. Yeah. But the potential is in all of them. Now, some of them come very, become very healthy trees, and very, very, um, uh, very healthy, and strong, and big, and whatever, and some are a little bit... Uh. So, I don't know if you have... You have how many of you have a vegetable garden, or flowers, or something? Have you ever noticed that you plant the same seeds, you give them the same conditions, but? Totally different. Totally different. Yeah, well, totally different. You know, even though you give them the same conditions, and they, so it seems as if these potential seeds here also have some kind of not exactly the same potential. That it's not just the outside conditions, but it's also something that is already in there, which probably comes from, not from them, but it comes from the tree where they were, which situation, blah, blah, blah. So this is what we would call karmic imprints, where there's something inside which can grow, potential is there, but it also needs the conditions. So this is when we talk about Buddha nature that everybody has, that this basic goodness, space, and intelligence that we all have, <coughs> it needs conditions to be found and to, to grow into a fully awakened mind. And this is what we're doing here. Yeah? So appreciating that we have this potential. Again, for some of you, when you hear this for the first time, and until now, you always identified with your negative emotions, it will be difficult to believe it. Then the step is to ask yourself again and again and again, when the ego comes and says, no, it's not true. It's like, you know, the, this has an ego and says, no, you're not an acorn. No, you can't be a tree. Well, then it will never be a tree because it will not kind of, this can, cannot move, but it will not go in the right direction to become a tree. Yeah? So then you ask yourself, you ask yourself, what can I lose if I start to believe in that potential? Again and again and again. What do I gain if I continue to identify with my negative sides? What do I gain? How much happiness? How much openness, how much space will it give me? And you don't need to find an answer. This is it. When you ask yourself these questions, 
while you're sitting in a quiet spot, don't, don't, ha don't have the answer come from the head. Allow, allow the mind to be exposed to these questions. Yeah? Like we have many, many questions and now with internet and, and Google and all this, we get instant, instant answers and then we start to take them, we start to take them on board without even examining it. Yeah, whatever is in Google is true, isn't it? Very reliable. That's what we think. And we forget to ask our own innate intelligence, our, our ability to see, our ability to experience and our, our ability to observe. Yeah? We don't trust that. So sometimes with these teachings, our nose has to be put in the right direction. Okay? okay? What can you lose if you start to believe in rebirth, for example? That something will continue at the time of death? And what can you, I'm, I don't want to convince you or convert you, okay? Just, this is questions I'm giving you that you have to ask yourself. And what can you lose when you start to really believe that you're a good person? Try it out. Try it out. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay? Yeah? Okay. So coming back, if you have more questions, you can write them down and then I'll, I'll answer them in the evening. I'll try to answer them. But this can be, this can be a, a hint, kind of, whatever I do for myself, is good for others, but doing for yourself, like developing love and compassion, this kind of thing, and whatever I do for others is good for me. Yeah? If we start to believe that, to look after ourselves, to, to let go of things that we know are harmful, because we do have that wisdom, knowing what is harmful, isn't it? But then also, how can we not go into, again, self-hate and all this? By understanding the law of cause and effect. Yeah? We develop habits and patterns by following these emotions. They become deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah? It's like with an addiction. You're not addicted with your first cigarette. But the more you, the more you think that the happiness is in the cigarette and then the body is getting used to this substance, the more you get addicted. And the quicker you can say stop, the easier it goes, right? So when you start to study these negative emotions, there's a few steps that you can do to deal with them. But first, that's, first what you need is awareness, mindfulness or whatever you want to call it. Being here, noticing what's going on, feeling the rush the rush of energy, feeling the moving of the energy, feeling the tightness that, it, that comes with the, with the emotion. And for that, you need to sit and train the mind to observe, to be awake, to be aware. Yeah? When you feel it, you have to pause, take a step back. That's the first step. Not to pause in ways of a kind of suppressing the emotion, but to, to really put yourself borders. Like you know how to react when you are angry. You know how you will react when you're full of desire. So you say, okay, I know I'm angry, or I know anger is in the mind. This is a better way of expressing it because then you don't identify with it. I have to be careful, so I will not talk, for example. Now, this would be pausing, not to act it out. With desire, I will not reach out. With jealousy, I will not badmouth the person. I will not try to destroy their happiness. Yeah. Like that. With arrogance, I will not go parading my good qualities all over the place. Yeah. This would be stopping. By stopping, by pausing, um, already you have made the step out of the emotion. So you can use methods, for example, by thinking when the mind is fairly calm, by thinking about the disadvantage of desire or aggression. Yeah. 
by thinking about karma. By using kind of trying to, to go into different mind states. Yeah, for example, with desire to go into different mind straight state of generosity or contentment. Instead of kind of focusing on what you don't have, you focus on what you have. There's no point saying, be content. It's not going to work. You need to give the mind tools so that it then thoughts, um, ideas, so that it does become content. And the way you can do that is by, um, by kind of imagining how it would be if you wouldn't have this and this and this and this. Yeah. See, if we start to say, oh, I have to be happy and content because I have this and this and this and this and this, very often nothing moves and we just feel guilty that we're not happy and content. And we get quite desperate by saying, oh, oh, I have all these things but I'm not happy and I'm not content because usually I think the things that you say what you have, yeah, um, what would you, when you're trying to, to generate contentment, what would you, wh what would the list be what you have, for example? Health. Health, Health for example, okay. Friends. What else? Huh? House. Love. Love? Where did that come from? <laughs> okay, good. But love more... Other people allow me to love them instead of, oh, other people love me. Yeah? Because the other people allowing us to love them is much more reliable than other people loving me. And it's, it, this does create contentment. Yeah? Then what else? What else would we try to do? Good food? Yeah, money. You never think about this? You never think, wow, I have more or less financial security. Satisfaction. Huh? Satisfaction. Satisfaction in work. Yes, for example, I have an interesting job. You know, I could have, maybe, you know, if I would have been born in Thailand, maybe I would be in this country uh, working in the fields or having to look after old people or cleaning houses. Now again, this it's, it can go both ways. It can go the way that then you feel guilty that you are not happy because they're not real reliable causes for happiness or contentment. So in order for the mind to go into contentment, you need to go the other way and really think, I could be a Thai worker in the field. I could be a cleaning woman when it's about work, when you don't want to go to work. I could not be able to pay my bills. I could be in hospital. I could be here and here and here and this and this and this. Yeah. I could not have access to good food or I could have, uh, you know, like a cancer of this tube here. I don't know what it's called. Uh, and then I won't be, a, and, and they have to feed me um, artificially. You know, we can, we can imagine all these difficult situations. Then you have a bigger chance that contentment will come. By seeing that what I have is not everybody has it. And I could be in a situation of not having it. Now, very often, again, you know, the, the ego mind rejects this kind of thing because we have heard it from our parents. When we are not happy with the food, then it was always, eh, think about the children in Africa who don't have anything to eat. And then one of these, one of the boys actually at one point, he said, Oh, well, then send the food to them. I don't want it. <laughs> if they're if they so, so hungry for this, then just send it to them. I don't want it. So this is why, again, you know, this is, it's not a skillful way because then the, the, our subconsciousness recognizes this kind of manipulation to manipulate us into being content because children who are content, they're much easier to handle than the ones who are not content, right? 